Okay, guys, so last time, um, so we're going we're to continue talking about earthquakes this week. So last time, um, uh, we talked about examples of earthquakes, basically. We sort of set the stage and, and talked about some of the um, famous and some of the uh, most relevant to us here in Southern California earthquake examples uh, through time. And so what I want to do today is, is sort of cycle back and talk a little bit more about the, the details, the specifics of, of earthquake uh, 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 understanding and, and modern, um, modern seismology and all that kind of good stuff. So as always, interrupt me if something doesn't make sense. Um, so we'll start with, a, a, I, I had a slide, one or one or two of these slides before we wrapped up last time, but suffice it to say, we have a lot of earthquakes. The earth is a very dynamic thing. It's constantly in motion, it's constantly moving. And so there's something on the order of more than a million earthquakes this year and every year. The vast majority of these, we, you and I can't uh, can't typically sense, um, and uh, uh, yeah, basically they're going on all the time. The earthquakes, even though we we experience them on the surface of the Earth, um, they typically are are much uh, deeper, much lower uh, down into the towards the center of the Earth. Um, we have different ways of measuring earthquakes. Um, we um, first really, well, actually, I should have put a picture. I didn't put a picture in. Um, actually, never mind. I'll, 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 I'll pause on this till we get to that in, in, a, in a few slides. Um, but but I, actually, I think I forgot to put a picture of some of the oldest earthquake measuring devices were from which were from um, ancient China um, that were pretty cool. Um, but it, operate on the same conceptual principles as, as what we still do to measure earthquakes. Um, key aspects of, of earthquake science, first and foremost, earthquakes are primarily a story of plate tectonics. So we'll review plate tectonics in a second again, briefly. Um, talk about some nomenclature. Uh, and then uh, while this isn't a geophysics class and I don't wanna get too far down the road here, um, just want to touch on some of the different types of energy waves, seismic waves that are generated in an earthquake and in the in the aftermath of an earthquake. And then we'll talk about intensity versus magnitude, and then um, finish up with talking about some current methods for how we uh, predict earth or, or, or how, how we're trying to be able to predict earthquakes. So again, plate tectonics. Uh, I found this this image uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I, I like this. It's an so artist rendering, um, but but this really, I think, um, nicely brings home this idea of these these superficial, uh, you know, um, cooling of the lava skin of rock on top of um, more fluid rock down below. And uh, we see these tectonic plates in a variety of uh, locations around the world. This is this is the top of the globe. Essentially, we're talking about each of these different lines here represents uh, an edge of one of these uh, uh, skins of the Earth that are floating on um, uh, stuff below us. And as a consequence, um, while we can have earthquakes literally anywhere on the surface of the Earth. Most typically, the vast majority, something like 70 to 80 percent of all of our earthquakes are going to occur at the edges of these tectonic plates. And so um, uh, when we look at the plates ar around the globe, the Pacific plate is really responsible. So this is this Again, we've mentioned this before in, in terms of the ring of fire in reference to the um, volcanic activity around the perimeter of the Pacific plate, primarily the perimeter of the Pacific plate. Um, we see the same thing 
with earthquakes. So something like 70 to 80 percent of all the earthquakes that happen in the world are happening um, in and around the edges of the Pacific plate. So yes, it, earthquakes can't, this is a risk that can pop up anywhere, um, but really the, the story is really concentrated in our neck of the woods. Uh, so I just said this, so, so most earthquakes are going to occur along the edges of plates with, with the Pacific plate really the, the epicenter. Um, we have a couple different types of faults, and a fault is just a fracture or a break or a discontinuity uh, in rock. Um, and in this case, we're speaking with speaking about rocks uh, related to these tectonic structures. Um, okay, a little bit about some terminology. So, uh, if we're looking at say our Earth Northridge earthquake, um, we were this was uh, let's see Northridge was when was Northridge Northridge was 1994 Martin Luther King's day 1994 in the morning and people woke up and they felt shaking right um, if you guys remember that you felt shaking um, we experience shaking th the middle the, the the center point the concentration of um, that shaking um, we often perceive as a big earthquake. Rarely, if ever, is that earthquake at the at the on the on the surface where the air is, right? More typically, it's down into the earth some distance, right? So that place where the um, where the earthquake energy is being released, where the movement begins, that is the folk. Well, there's a couple different terms, but but that's the focus of the start of the event. If you then draw an imaginary line straight up above that, okay, straight up above till you hit the air, that is the epicenter. So the epicenter is not the is not the um, the um, three dimensional center of the earthquake. It's where we perceive it to be centered on the on the two dimensional surface of the Earth, um, right? And so all these earthquakes are happening along faults. Um, again, faults are, are breaks in rock. They're breaks in rock and, and there's some pressure or, or there's um, tension built up, right? So, so let's say, um, whichever hand this looks like to you, this, this is my uh, left hand, but for you, it looks like my right hand, I think, right? Where this, this guy's, let's say, trying to go up, and this guy's say trying to go down, and uh, and it's not lubricated, right? We don't have a bunch of oil in there or synthetics, or it's not a machined, you know, it's a sanded piece of wood that's very smooth. So so you can imagine I'm, I'm pushing down with my hand and nothing's happening, and now I'm kind of a little bit slipping, okay? And so that is building up along these faults. When when the this happens, when the movement happens, when that pressure releases, when that pressure exceeds the friction, the movement exceeds the ability of the friction to work against that movement. Um, then we get movement and we get that, that energy is released, a vast amount of energy, and then propagates through the Earth's structures in the form of seismic waves. And you and I feel that as an earthquake. Again, this is, I, I showed you this before, but this is just a little quick animation of tectonic plates moving around. And, uh, and this is obviously the scales over millions of years, but um, the same idea is happen, happening every second of the day. There's a little more pressure building up, a little more pressure building up. You and I just don't necessarily see it. These, um, the, the, the typical, the typical uh, movement say of our North American plate and Pacific plate moving past each other are moving on average, on average, about as fast as your fingernails grow, okay? Um, now that doesn't mean every single second it's moving that, that exact amount on average, right? So the movement is, is punctuated, right? It's chick, 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 chick. And so, so that, uh, that estimate of, of movement is, is uh, over the longer term. Okay, so these things that you and I are on, these, these continents, right? So we're on these um, 
Ventura County chunk of, of land. Um, that is on the crust. And that crust is over the mantle. That mantle is in the core. Um, and what is essentially going to happen is we have a couple different types of meeting together of these plates. Sometimes they're going to bash up against each other like the Himalayas and, and shove up. Sometimes they're going to bash up and go down. Sometimes they might be pulling apart. Sometimes they might be moving along uh, uh, one another or, or, or um, parallel to one another or perpendicular to one another, actually parallel. Um, so this is our, this is our structure. Um, and there's this, in the, in the, as we head into the mantle, it's warm, right? It's hot. And so when we do have this subduction, we do have one plate or one, one chunk of rock going down, eventually that's going to get uh, remelted and, and burbled around and eventually pop back up somewhere else as a solid rock. Okay, just, just to uh, uh, make sure that, I don't know why I put this in again twice, but basically, um, so epicenter again, right above the focus of the quake. Um, we can all, the the geophysicists refer to that um, not so much as the focus they usually call it the hypocenter. Um, again, that that's down in the rocks. Uh, the seismic waves are going to pr propagate in all directions. So in um, you know a spherical um, casting emanating out from that focus, it's going to be located at a fault. Okay. <clears throat> some faults are easy to detect, some are not. And so um, very frequently, we have a hard time detecting these faults. Well, okay, let me, let me step back. So if we have a situation like this, uh, if this is our, our, our chunk of Ventura County, right, we'd have some, let's say some uh, land up here, some farms or whatever, some farms on here, and we can have maybe this escarpment, which might, um, by looking at the rocks and seeing that this rock is similar to this rock down here, et cetera. We could, um, geologists, this is what they do for a living, they can deduct, ah, this is a fault, right? And so if we know it's a fault, we know there's at least some potential risk of an earthquake around there. You can also get the situation where maybe this eroded, maybe, maybe there's, there's a river over here or there's a dam break or something, and this material got poured, you know, sort of this, this uh, um, face, was buried or is buried underneath more recent sedimentary deposits. Um, that becomes a challenge because we can't easily necessarily recognize that fault called a blind fault. And so we don't understand that there, there for example, is potential uh, earthquake hazard or elevated earthquake hazard at that particular location. And so this is, this is a very common story um, where, uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll save that for a little bit. But basically, um, faults that are on the surface are e relatively easy to find, easy to detect, relatively easy to begin to do research on to understand potential risk. Blind faults, hidden things are not so easy. Um, once the propagation begins, there's several different types of waves, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, there's, there's surface waves and there's waves that move along inside the earth itself. I just talked about these. So earthquake is, is movement of the earth. Um, seismic waves that are, is the propagation of that, that uh, energy that was potential energy. And then in, as we enter the earthquake, it turns into kinetic energy. So the propagation of that kinetic energy. Uh, the focus or hypocenter is in the earth. The epicenter is that spot right above it uh, on the surface of the earth. So there's various types of faults, as we mentioned, um, three, three broad types, essentially a, a spreading or, or where we have um, one plate or one chunk of rock moving away from the, another chunk, uh, compressional where they're coming together and, and pushing on each other, which tends to push one up and, and take one down. Um, uh, or you can also get uplift, but, but that the compressional is more typical. And then you can get these strike slip faults that one is moving 
past the other. And that is what's going on in the San Andreas Fault, our probably most famous fault. That if anybody's ever heard of a fault, they've heard of, especially in California, they've heard of the San Andreas. And so that's what's going on here, whereas the Pacific Plate is going, um, which runs from basically Baja up through the uh, up through Northern California and goes out to sea uh, a little bit north of San Francisco. Um, uh, that plate is moving uh, northwestward, or, or excuse me, excuse me, those, those that rock is moving northwestward, and the uh, North American plate is moving southeastward. Uh, I'll show you guys a little quick video, which is only like a minute long here. And we can uh, look at just a, an illustration of some of these faults. In a normal fault, the block above the fault, called the hanging wall, moves down relative to the block below the fault, called the foot wall. This fault motion is caused by tensional forces and results in extension. In a reverse fault, the hanging wall moves up relative to the foot wall. This motion is caused by compressional forces and results in overall shortening. A strike slip fault is a near vertical fracture where the ground has shifted parallel to Earth's surface due to horizontal shearing forces. If you stand on one side of the fault and the block opposite you shifts left, it is called a left lateral fault. If it moves right, it's a right lateral fault. Okay. Oops. All right. Okay, so so again, that we're not this is not a geology class. So I don't want to go into too much detail, but suffice to say we have these these different flavors of faults that produce different types of earthquakes. This is a highly simplified uh, uh, regime, but this is sort of um, a representation of the types of of stresses that are building up. Um, in different parts of the U.S. In a, in a very generic sense. So again, here uh, where we are, the, the San Andreas, we have a, a chunk uh, moving um, south, uh, excuse me, a chunk moving, yeah, southeast and a chunk moving northwest. We have some areas that are spreading and we have some areas that are basically uh, banging into one another. Now, the 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 current theory that was that was really um, uh, first proposed in the wake of the 1906 earthquake and is now the the, um, uh, the 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 dominant theory for how we think about how earthquakes uh, occur and, and and move is essentially we have these these forces that are squeezing and and rock has been constrained squished if you will or squeezed maybe i shouldn't say squished necessarily but squeezed um and then what an earthquake boom happens and we release that and we get some some re deformation of the um of, of the surface of the land and that that so the tension is building up it's tension it's tension it's tension and then we have the earthquake and it releases that energy, at least for a period of time, releases that energy, and then we get to some new equilibrium, and then just about immediately, the pressures start building up again. If this was only to be, if the pressure was only happening in my, in my, where my hands are meeting, right, then, then it would kind of, it would be, um, it would be just that simple, but we've come to also realize is that what happens is as you know, rock is on rock, right? And as this as this moves, um, we release the pressure in the main area where the where the epicenter, let's say, was. Right? We release the pressure in that vicinity, but we may well build up the pressure in other chunks, right? So so we may be squeezing those rocks up, you know, 100 kilometers north of us or something like that. So so it's this constant constant tension over here release over there tension over here release over there and it's just the, the story of a, of a dynamic earth okay and so i don't know if i can show this too easily i was going to try to do this so again what's really going on can you guys can you guys see me okay here yeah yeah okay good so basically um one of the reasons why um it's so hard to predict when earthquakes are going to happen 
and we'll talk about at the end of this we'll talk about what we're trying to do to to um get better at this but the reason why um you know a wildfire is coming towards us right we might not know might not be able to predict right now the if we're going to have a wildfire um in uh camarillo in july right we can talk about probabilities and stuff as we can talk about with earthquakes long-term probabilities um but once the once we start to get into fire weather and once a fire starts then we have a pretty good we can get some pretty good estimates of if the fire is going to um, you know, impact your neighborhood or not, right? Same thing with hurricanes and 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 um, we've talked about volcanoes and things of that nature. Earthquakes are a lot more challenging because what's going on is there's so so here I have a, a coaster. Yeah, everybody see my coaster. And if I you can't rub it, sorry, we're all virtual. But if you could rub it, it'd feel sort of smooth. It feel fair. You know, it's this is this is this uh, nice. Um, uh, I don't know where I bought this. Where did I buy this? I bought this in. Oh, it's made in Turkey. That's an, that's a whole other story. We can talk about my my Turkish earthquake stories. Um, but I think I got this at Hearst Castle. I think several years ago. Um, and so it's this sort of soapstony kind of looking stuff. And so from afar, it looks very smooth and it feels very smooth. And if I take my take my um, Take my uh, uh, aluminum can and just put it on here. You know, it, it's 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 fairly smooth. However, if I take another um, similar type of stone from I don't know where I bought this one. <laughs> I'm gonna stop looking at the stop looking at the labels of my my coasters, um, and I put these guys together. Um, they're still so fairly smooth, but I don't know if you probably can't hear this, but so I'm gonna I'm gonna touch my finger on here. And, and push just ever so slightly. Nothing's happening. You see the moving? So there's small imperfections in here, right? There's jagged parts of the rock. There's there's holes in the rock. There's, there's all these different surfaces, these complex surfaces. So from far away, it might look smooth. But if we were to look close on the microscope, we would see jaggedy, 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 jaggedy. And when you guys saw me, I was pushing with the same constant force or trying to as close as I could. Did it, did it just smoothly move? Do you guys remember? I'll, I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Right? It didn't smoothly move. Right? So I kind of add the pressure and it kind of, at some point, it, oh, there. Oh, there it goes. Right. So it's it's this sort of fit and starts. And so being able to figure. So what that means is, so as I'm doing this, so, you know, I don't know, we'll make it up. This little teeny dot hooked a, a piece in here. Right. And then I pushed and I pushed and I pushed. And eventually the amount of pressure exceeded the, the friction, the resistance from this little chunk. And it started to move. And how far did it move? It moved till it got caught on the next lip the next little uh discontinuity and so what that means is right so if we had a if, if, if we machine this and we went and looked at this under a you know scanning electron microscope or something we mapped this highly detailed i suppose some some topologist genius could could map this out and, and predict where this would hang but in the real world we can't do that right these 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 faults are going down into the earth and they could hang up any, just virtually any location in that three-dimensional part of that two chunk of rock meeting together at that face, right? So that's why it's so hard to predict. Hey, when you know where is this going to happen? And when it does happen, is it going to is it going to scooch you know a millimeter? Is it going to scooch an inch? Is it going to scooch a meter? That's what's hard to understand. And that's why it's so hard to predict when an earthquake is going to happen. And uh, well, well, at the large scale, we can do long, long term averages, but but predicting for you to know tomorrow if there's going to be an earthquake, it is much harder than these other disasters we've spoken about so far in our class. OK, uh, questions so far. Does that make sense so far, you guys? OK. All right, so um, here, here's our here's our two uh, our two plates moving together, our, our, our fault, and then and then something happens, then it moves. Okay, so once we move, we're going to get that propagation of energy, just like 
if we throw a rock in a pond and we see those those waves spreading out, it's just in three dimensions, remember, um, that's the same type of thing. So um, we can imagine, for example, on the left-hand side, let's say our earthquake started, and then the energy is going to propagate away from that point, from that from that focal uh, center, and it's going to have it's going to the 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 type of the energy, the way the energy is going to propagate is going to fall into a few different um, uh, potential uh, patterns. Um, now, th there's actually finer gradations of this, and if we were taking a, a class on just on earthquakes, we would get into all the different. Um, uh, nuances and and um, more subtle variations of these things, but for us, we're just going to talk about three different types of waves, um, and primarily because they're used in prediction. So again, this is not a phys physics class per se. Um, so we have surface waves, which, as the name implies, move along the surface of the Earth, and then we have two types of two broad types of seismic waves. They're going to move through the Earth. Okay, so we have P waves and S waves, primary waves and secondary waves. Um, let's see, do I want to have a, yeah, okay. Um, so I'll go in more detail in a second, but just real briefly, um, the surface waves are sort of what you and I are experiencing, okay, typically. Um, the, the, P waves and the S waves, while they can lead to destruction and can cause, and obviously the energy is moving, and if it gets to the right location, we can have all kinds of problems. But primarily, the P waves and S waves we're interested in because they help us understand um, uh, where the earthquake happened. So they're very, very important in terms of diagno um, the diagnostics of um, where did the earthquake originate from, what's the strength. Um, et cetera, maybe perhaps where some tsunamis might be um, expected, that type of um, thing. Okay, so uh, P waves are these um, push pulls. So imagine, imagine a slinky, right? So a P wave is, is um, oh, I didn't say this before, or maybe I didn't say this. So uh, surface waves are the slowest, uh, P waves are the fastest. Okay, so uh, uh, the P waves, the primary waves through the rocks are, imagine a slinky, right? So imagine we had a slinky kind of stretched out and then you kind of pushed it from the one side of the slinky. You would see that slinky, that, that the, the coils, you know, compress and that compression would propagate through the slinky. So sometimes people call these push-pull waves. Um, just calling me. No. Okay. Good. Um, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So they're going to move through, um, through solids and liquids. So this, these can move through water as well as rock. Um, S waves are, uh, going to do more of this up down. Okay. So S waves are more like, a more like uh, someone doing the, the centipede, right? Um, and then surface waves are are kind of everything together can can go up up down, right left, all that kind of stuff. And this is what is really um, the damaging part of um, of earthquakes. And how we do it on time? Okay. The velocity with which these seismic waves are going to spread out from the focus it is very complex. I do not pretend to understand it. It is a, a consequence of the composition of the rock and the varied rock strata that are going to go, that are be all around the area. And so, um, generally speaking, as the rocks are going to get denser and denser the waves are going to be able to move more quickly through that. So the denser the rock, the faster the wave will be able to move through it. Every time we go from a chunk of rock A into chunk of rock B or strata of rock A into strata of rock B, um, that's going to change the velocity. It's going to depend on the composition of that material, whether that means the speed of the wave is going to increase or the speed of the wave is going to um, uh, slow down. Um, uh, 
uh, yeah, okay. And then because of compression, some of these waves move through water, some don't. Um, uh, so, so this is getting very complicated, right? And so if we, if we can very accurately measure the, the speed of this, we can actually use it as a diagnostic tool to look at what the earth is made up of. And indeed, this is one of the main ways that geologists look at the structure of the earth. Indeed, petroleum uh, geologists, people who are looking for oil deposits, this is basically what they do. They make their own earthquakes. So they make their own earthquakes with, with essentially big banging or setting off of explosives and create mini earthquakes, right? So they create these mini seismic waves. And those waves are going to propagate through the uh, through an area, and then by by having sensors arrayed around the area um, after they've set off these 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 initiated these seismic waves, they can therefore diagnose what the rock structure is like. And in the case of petroleum geologists, they're looking for oil, oil and gas, that kind of stuff. But um, the same exact principle applies to uh, geologists that are just looking at the structure of the earth. And indeed, we can also use this not to just look at the types of, of, of different rock material, but we can actually use this to look at the inner density of the earth's core and things of that nature. So again, beyond me, I don't, I don't do this. I don't know how, how this really works, but, but the principle, you guys can see the principle is the same. Okay, so uh, we have an earthquake. Uh, we can measure stuff. We'll talk about how we measure it. But um, this is a seismogram. So this is a graph of the energy that is moving or, or, or yeah, the movement of the earth in one particular location. And so uh, from this, we can, um, uh, uh, just like we can diagnose uh, things from a heartbeat, you can diagnose different things in terms of um, the earthquake, where it originated from. Um, uh, where it's likely to go next, et cetera. Okay, and so what, we're, what we do is, by if we just had one seismometer, if we just had one detector, that, that wouldn't really do any good. But in a modern sense, we have networks. So we have the USGS network, we have um, some global networks, we have different countries have their own networks. And all these, these sensors together allow us to have uh, a net, if you will, of sensors across the surface of the earth and sometimes uh, inside the earth. And so when we have a, an array of sensors, we can actually look at, in, a very, in very precise uh, timing mechanisms or clocks, we can look at uh, uh, backtracking, right? So we can look at the essentially the footprint of the earthquake and backtrack to where it, it came from. And so, um, again, we mentioned there's P waves, there's S waves, et cetera. And so by knowing what type of wave, right, by looking at the, the characteristic um, type of um, presentation of that energy, um, we can uh, 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 graph it out and say, ah, uh, you know, so if we have a, a sensor, say, in Ventura County, and a sensor in Santa Barbara County, and a sensor in San Luis Obispo County, and a sensor in Monterey County, et cetera, and then we have sensors, so you say go, you know, basically north, then if we have sensors that go basically east, um, go out into the ocean, go south, by having all this stuff together, we can start to get a sense of where um, the epicenter was. Um, and it looks something like, and one of the things you can do, in addition to looking at which wave, so the S waves and, and the timing of the S wave arriving, let's say, or the timing of the P wave or what have you, uh, we can overlap this. And so if we had a if we had a, um, a sensor here in the purple and a sensor here in the yellow and a sensor here in the, I don't know what that is, gray, we can essentially use triangulation. Yeah, we don't care about this. We're not gonna do this, but, but we can use triangulation to uh, figure out the, uh, the direction of the waves propagation and then work back to the um, center. How we do this is with seismometers. So this is a, a visualization of an, of an old style seismometer. Now they're electronic and things, but the basic idea is this. The basic idea is we have some um, very, very stable platform that is isolated from movement, okay? So, so the inertia of gravity 
is going to keep uh, some aspect of the instrument. Historically, it was a big heavy metal ball um, with a very fine needle at the end of it. And so this was suspended on a, str uh, you know, early it was a string, but, but the, the uh, ancient uh, Chinese versions of this were a big, were a big um, vase thing in the middle. And then there's all these metal balls. And the, when it shook, um, the inertia allowed the balls to flop out. And I think it fell out of a dragon's mouth and into a, what was it a dragon's mouth and into like a fish mouth or a frog's mouth or something like that it was pretty, pretty cool. Um, anyway, uh, the idea here is, is this metal ball and this cartoon is going to stay safe or is it going to stay stable, right? So if we accidentally, you know, stepped or banged or, 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 or vibrated the device, the base would move, the, the arm right here would move, but this, but this ball would essentially uh, stay put. The, by putting a piece of paper, let's say, underneath there, as, and, and maybe we had some ink on this needle, as that, as that moved, you would get a trace of a vibration. And that was the original seismometers. That, that's essentially the same principle used today, although now we use uh, more fancy um, isolation mechanisms and stuff. And by, by running this, this piece of paper, now it's electronic, but piece of paper at a constant speed, you can actually go back in time, right? So you can say, oh my God, you feel the earthquake right now. You run to your instrument and you go, oh, you know, when, what time did it start? And you can know exactly when it started, uh, uh, how long it went, how strong it was, et cetera. Haha, -ha, funny. Um, okay, so there's two key things. Uh, actually, maybe we'll, we'll take a pause here since it's about, about 10 minutes for our break, but this might be a good place to take a pause. So we'll take a, a quick 10 minute pause. Everybody take a stretch. Actually, first, let me ask, any questions about that stuff so far? Uh, yeah, uh, for P waves, you said they're push pull and like a mm -hmm. sneaky. What mm -hmm. causes them to bounce back after they've? Uh... Oh, it, sorry. So it, it's, it's the, it's the uh, structure of the rock itself. So the, so the rock, is, and, and it'll be different types of rock, but it, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem right. Because you think, oh, rock. And then I, if I push the rock, I think conceptually we'd think of, you know, if I, if I pushed hard on this rock, it would crack and it would, it would break and it turned into little dust or something, right? And it wouldn't, it wouldn't re-go back into a, a coaster form, right? Um, but in reality, when we have you know, a rock at depth at pressure, when we squeeze it, there's some level of elasticity in there. So uh, it's the nature of the material, basically. So it can just be moving through like soil. I don't know if there's a big mm -hmm. rock. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although typically, yes. So, so yeah, so right. Typically though, where most of this energy is moving through underneath the earth, it's not soil. It's gonna be more consolidated strata. But um, the soil is typically the eroded stuff we think about is, is more typically on the surface of the earth. And by the time it gets, if it's if it's a deep, if it's an old deposit from five million years ago, it's going to be much more compressed typically than our, than what we think of soil like out in front of your house type of thing. But yeah, cool. Other questions? Okay, so let's take a quick uh, ten minute break, and we'll come back and and keep talking about. Uh, I forget what we were talking about. We're oh, we were going to talk about um, magnitude and intensity. Cool. Let me go. I'm a drink, and I will be back in ten minutes, you guys. Sorry about that. Um, I went in and I tossed in another, uh, I, I went and grabbed a picture of that. Uh, I couldn't find a good one, but I have a blurry one of, uh, okay, so so um, so we were talking about our, our modern seismometer that, that generate our seismographs, the, the measurement of, um, Stuff and this is a blurry photo, but this is this is one of that. This is from about two thousand years ago. This is that that Chinese um, cool thing. So we have they're surrounded by these uh, frogs, and there's a little there's 
it's hard to tell, but there's a little brass ball inside each of these dragons' mouths. And as it shakes, just like j- just like here, just like our needle being uh, sort of stagnant and inertia governing in its movement, and then if the earthquake were to happen, it would it would move the surrounding structure. The same thing here with the idea that the ball would fall out of the mouth, and that would tell you which direction um, the earthquake was was going towards, and therefore which which direction it came from. Um, and then also, I just found also it's not a great picture, but but uh, I just wanted to emphasize, and we're measuring, uh, we're, we're 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 estimating where the focus of the earthquake was um i just want to re-emphasize that this is in a three-dimensional uh sense so i think i was talking I, the examples i gave were on the surface of the earth that's where our stations are but we can um uh very accurately now uh estimate how these um waves are propagating through rocks and things okay so uh picking up where we were leaving off so uh two things we want to uh or, or two common um quantifications for an earthquake First is going to be the magnitude. This is how much energy is released as that slip happens, as that one chunk of rock moves against that other chunk of rock. And so we've historically used what's known as the Richter scale. We don't use that anymore. But the basic idea is, the conceptual idea is, is the same. Um, there's just some limitations with the Richter scale when we get to really, really big earthquakes. And so we, we've modified the Richter scale. But the idea here was to look at the maximum amplitude of one of those S waves and, uh, and, then, and then talk about how much energy was released. The issue with earthquakes is there's, we're talking about such vast amounts of energy and it gets logistically hard to, to talk about stuff um, uh, and, and to visualize it because there is such a massive range as we mentioned, the vast majority of earthquakes are too small for you or I to sense uh, in a typical sense on the surface of the earth. And then we have these you know, gigantic, you know, cataclysmic, devastating earthquakes in 89 or 94 or 2010 or whenever it is. And so um, uh, we typically reference this large range of um, value by using a logarithmic scale, not a linear scale. So important to remember that in this scale, for every one number, so a magnitude two earthquake versus a magnitude three earthquake, right, is gonna be um, more than 30 times, going from one number to the other number is gonna be more than 30 times stronger. Um, and then it, it it is an exponential thing, right? It's a logarithmic thing, technically speaking. And so if we go from a five to a seven, we're almost a thousand. So a, a magnitude seven earthquake is almost a thousand times stronger than a magnitude five earthquake. So again, just sort of similar to our debate or not debate, I should, shouldn't use the term, similar to the um, ignorance surrounding climate change, when people, when we talk about a degree or two of warming, right? A lot of people, like, ah, oh, degree is not that bad. They, they, they completely misunderstand the, the meaning and the, the magnitude of force and change that has to occur to produce, say, a degree or two of average global temperature change. Similar here, when people hear, oh, it's a six or a, a five versus a six, um, most people are defaulting to thinking of it as a linear, on a linear scale. And they think, oh, you know, six is only, a, you know, it's, oh, it's bigger than five, but it's not that much bigger. They're not understanding it's 30 times more intense, or, or I should say 30 times a greater magnitude of energy released. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, um, we don't need to spend too much time on this, but I'll just suffice it to say that um, uh, the Richter scale was, was a, a huge um, step forward, a huge leap forward in terms of communicating, understanding, diagnosing um, earthquakes. The problem was just at the very extremes, at, at, at the largest end of the earthquakes, it um, oftentimes the sensors wouldn't really work right. And, and the way we'd physically graph this out initially 
um, had limitations. And so as a consequence, we've now, we still use magnitude of the earthquake, but we use not the Richter scale, we use what's known as the momentum magnitude scale. But same idea, it's a logarithmic scale. And as we go higher in uh, number, we're getting much more destructive earthquakes. And so again, um, and, and therefore fewer, thank God, fewer of them, right? So we don't have a thousand magnitude nines or anything like that in any one year, right? Um, so so the magnitude of the earthquake, just, just don't use the term Richter in there, okay? Cool. The other key uh, quantification of earthquakes, so, what, so magnitude is the amount of energy released. Intensity is how, it, how that earthquake event presents itself on the surface of the earth. And this is very much an observational thing. This is very analogous to our hurricane, our, our categories that we discussed when we talked about hurricanes, right? So if you recall, those, um, those measures of, of the strength of a hurricane came from uh, uh, folks that worked for the Red Cross working in Central America, looking at destruction, right? And trying to, to give them an aid to respond to the disaster in a way to bin, is this hurricane really bad? Is this hurricane not so bad, et cetera? So it was an observational scale. And that's where this uh, Mercalli scale comes from. So it, uh, and in fact, originally it was, it was, it was um, a drafted, created in California. Um, one, because of California, but two, because of just the number of earthquakes that we have going on here um, and historically have had going on here. And so the idea is to give it a, a, a number which corresponds to potential destruction, right? So, or, or how much you felt it. And so it goes from one to meaning, meaning, you know, I, I, there was an earthquake. I didn't know there was an earthquake, right? Uh, and, 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 and by not felt, not just you were sleeping through, I sleep through earthquakes all the time, right? So I wake up and like, oh, there's an earthquake last night and talk to people, like, oh, I woke up. I never seem to wake up to earthquakes. Um, so not that. We're talking about if you were actually awake, uh, you know, out in front of your house, not talk on the phone, not, not jam into your tunes, but we're actually, you know, quiet. And, and even then you would not be able to feel a, um, a, a, category one quake. And then moving all the way up to everything's falling down around me, right? And so again, just like our hurricane categories, it's based on the destructive, potential destructive effect of the, um, the surface presentation of the earthquake. So we have magnitude, we have intensity. Uh, that intensity is going to come from a variety of sources. Or, or let me, let me, let me not say it that way. Uh, the intensity is going to come is a the intensity is a consequence of a variety of factors. Let me say it that way. Obviously, the amount of energy released is going to be a huge part of that, right? If we had a a magnitude seven quake versus a magnitude one, magnitude seven is going to be much higher intensity, right? Uh, it's going to depend heavily on the geology of the area and particularly on the immediate lens of stuff that, that our building is built upon, our roadway is built upon, you are standing upon, et cetera. And um, it's not just a factor of, are we resisting the earthquake? It's, we can also have the, the um, uh, conditions such that we magnify, we concentrate, we have a more, more intense earthquake in this particular location than maybe just you know, a few hundred meters or a kilometer or two away from me. So all that stuff's gonna go into the, the, the intensity that as realized in any one particular location on the surface of the earth. Um, already talked about this, uh, suffice it to say, uh, the big earthquake, I mean, now, any earthquake could cause a problem, could make you uh, misstep, fall, bonk your head, and could be catastrophic if you, you know, suffered a concussion, let's say. So in theory, any earthquake is potentially dangerous. But clearly, as we go up into higher and higher magnitudes, the likelihood of, of disasters 
uh, and the likelihood of that disaster affecting larger swaths of the population, larger chunks of society is going to obviously go up more and more. And so what we're really worried about is when we start to get into the fives and the sixes and the sevens, that's really where we see um, problems coming. And then by the time we get up to, you know, eight, it's, it's um, sort of uh, end of the world type stuff. Um, okay, a couple uh, so questions about that so far. Questions about magnitude and intensity. Yeah, how uh, consistent is Mercalli intensity? Because like, can't I think this happened in the 1906 earthquake? Um, you said that there was downplay of the earthquake. So could a city be like, oh, it wasn't bad here at all, and then it would just screw up records? They could, but but the USGS will be all and in, in, in the case of what's happening with us, the USGS would be all over it, right? So the USGS would, so as we'll talk about in a, in a couple minutes, when we get to the prediction stuff, you guys can go right now and look at real-time data. So it gets a lot harder to, to hide that when now everybody can see it, right? Um, if we're in a place like North Korea, uh, if we're in a place like, um, I mean, I mean, I mean, well, yeah. So, so, so in the U.S., it's hard to hide that, right? I don't, I don't think you can hide it now. Um, uh, partly it's because in places like California, we have such a good understanding of the geology. Now, we don't, we don't understand that, oh, this, we, we might not recognize there's a fault right there. There might be a, a blind fault that we don't know until an earthquake happens on it. But still, by and large, we, we get where the major earthquakes are. We get, and, we, and geologists have spent, you know, over a hundred years now, intensively mapping the subsurface geology of the state of California. So we have a pretty good sense of what's going on. Also, as we'll hear about in a few minutes, um, um, modern engineers, modern building engineers, construction, as people are designing buildings, they will be looking for at least some of these phenomenon that could lead to more intense shaking. So the issues were really um, like like last time when we talked about the Mexico City earthquake or or these other um, locations. The problem with uh, people downplaying intensity was before we understood what was up. Now that we know what's going on with Mexico City, you you, you can't really hide that um, anymore. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Ne uh, number next or other questions? Okay, so uh, so that's sort of earthquakes happening. My my talk about earthquakes happening again. I'm not a geologist, as you can tell. I'm not. This is not my strong suit. Um, uh, but let's now get into sort of okay. The earthquake has happened. Let's start to talk about some of the consequences of earthquakes and how we how we deal with them in a modern modern uh, place like California. Um, so a couple key concepts here in terms of the damage that will manifest from earthquakes. Uh, ground failure, which is just the, the, the collapse of, of, you know, shaking of the earth, and then that's going to lead to a, a building, your house falling down, the, um, the uh, highway overpass collapsing, that kind of stuff. Uh, another key thing we'll have is very often fires. Again, with the, with the classic story of the 1906 fire in San Francisco, more destruction, more death happened, more economic dislocation happened as a consequence of the fires relative to the um, shaking itself. Um, and so that, so broken gas lines, electrical lines. So when we moved into our house, we had an inspector and we hired a, a home inspector that, uh, uh, you know, people said it was a good guy and he's like crawling everywhere and say, oh, this is wrong with the house and that's got to fix that and all that kind of stuff. He actually said, oh, um, you're, he was surprised that, oh my gosh, your house, so we live in Ventura County. He says, oh my God, your house doesn't have an automatic gas shutoff valve. I'm like, what? Oh my God, that sounds crazy. And so we went and looked at it and turns out, um, at least at the time, Ventura County did not require an automatic gas shutoff valve. And this gentleman mostly worked in Los Angeles County. And so he was used to the, the regulations in Los Angeles County. So in LA County, um, 
the gas line comes in your house for most people. You don't have to have gas, but most people have natural gas coming into their house for their water heater, for cooking, um, for, for maybe just their, 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 their heater, their furnace, HVAC. And so right where that comes into the house, uh, there is a valve. And you guys should all know this in terms of just basic disaster pre preparation or the apartment that you guys are living in now, wherever. You guys should move into a place, you know, unpack your boxes, you know, put your underwear away, all that kind of stuff, get your, get, or your cable hookup. But then you should make sure you know where your water shutoffs, uh, shutoff is and where your gas shutoff is. And so everybody will have a valve that you can manually turn to, to not allow gas to come onto your property anymore. What this gentleman was talking about was an automatic valve. So anytime there's a certain amount of shaking, it will it will seal off the pipe with the idea being that the street might catch on fire, but hopefully your house won't. And that's in response to so many fires in the wake of, of uh, earthquakes. So uh, fire, and, and, and we can also get fire, not just from classically from natural gas, but also in theory, you can get fire started from down power lines, right? So electrical line sparking, hit some grass, the grass catches fire, et cetera. So fire is a common thing that erupts in the wake of earthquakes um, uh, in, in the built, land, built environments. Uh, we can also get landslides. So this would be in hilly areas. Now, places like Ventura County, this is a very real thing. If we were in, I don't know where we'd be, if we were in um, the Central Valley of California, it wouldn't be that big a deal, right? But for us, uh, small hills can lead to landslides more mountainous structures, significant structures like the Santa Monica's, Los Padres, we can get um, some significant uh, landslides there as well. And then the biggest one, and this is, this is I think, a little bit what Joe was talking about, or, or, or at least one of the aspects that sort of referenced what he was talking about, is this notion of so-called liquefaction. And so this is where we have either water saturated or not necessarily water saturated, but but unconsolidated materials, classic would be sand, um, materials that just get, that just, um, if we look at them, if you step on them, it's like, it's all good. But it's almost like those crazy movies from the 30s where everybody died uh, in, um, in quicksand. Like, what the hell? Like, there's no such thing as quicksand or, well, there isn't any real kind of thing like quicksand. Well, for, first you either died in quicksand or scuba divers died in a giant clam clamping on their legs. Those are like the classic things from the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, so there's no real such thing as, as quicksand as envisioned by Hollywood, right? Um, but liquefaction is kind of like making Hollywood real, right? So with the shaking and the period of the shaking, that material that seems solid, you could walk on, you could ride your bike on, you could do whatever, um, becomes like liquid and hence the term liquefaction and then the the ability to hold up the the pier piling the 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 skyscraper whatever essentially goes to nothing uh and then one thing which which we're, we won't talk about uh uh here but we'll just acknowledge that it's it's another thing we're going to be talking about um you can also generate tsunamis so tsunami is a, a large displacement um underwater that is going to lead to um, a tsunami wave. Um, and these can be quite large. They're typically much smaller than that, but in theory, they could be you know, tens of meters high, depending on uh, the locations. So these are all key aspects of earthquake damage. Ground failure, uh, subsequent fire in the built, in, built environment, landslides for areas that are not flat, liquefaction for potentially anywhere, and tsunamis, um, uh, or the generation of tsunamis which can impact the local area, but also could go across ocean basin, ocean, ocean basins. Okay, so we talk about uh, uh, surface waves. Uh, there's two, two broad categories of those surface waves we could talk about, we didn't mention before, but in the context of talking about damage and destruction, we can get the up-down motion, okay? Any surface wave is dangerous and bad and horrible and bad news. But um, so the surface waves is, you know, up, down, boom, boom, boom. You can imagine things shaking, falling off uh, shelves and things of that nature. The second type is actually oftentimes more damaging. And this is the side to side. So that's where, you know, a wall just gets ripped off a building, 
et cetera. Many of our homes, as I think we touched upon this in our hurricane lecture, many of our homes are designed such that the, uh, uh, part of the strength of the home is the outer shell. So it's not, most homes are not built with completely suspended, um, uh, uh, you know, internal structures that hold everything up. The walls and the roof themselves uh, comprise a key part of the structural support, keeping those, uh, keep, keeping the building up. And so as we have these, these side to side forces, it's particularly destructive because once you have a little bit of failure of one part of the building, you can have the, the whole building collapse. Um, so here's some data. It's from a couple of years ago, but it just serves a point. So here on the X axis, we have uh, the momentum magnitude. Over here, we have the number of deaths per earthquake. And so staring at this, you guys, um, somebody interpret this for me. So let me, let me take a look at this for me and tell me um, our, our uh, and, then, and then some of them we have dates on. Like most of the dots are, it's too hard to put the dates on, but but um, more significant um, uh, earthquakes, a few more recent earthquakes uh, are are highlighted there. So can you guys? So what do you guys think about this? Earthquake fatalities and and the magnitude of shaking, or the magnitude of of the earthquake. Uh, what do you guys think? Is, are they related to one another? These these are obviously this is obviously a. Uh, so this magnitude, just recall, this is, even though it's, it's, it looks linear, this is a logarithmic scale, remember? And this is, is obviously a logarithmic scale, as you can tell from the, the units. So we have a log scale, log scale. Okay. So have a, have a gander that for a second and tell me if you guys think that uh, more earthquake or larger earthquakes or more people die. Uh, well, they correlate, but there's like also a bunch of other factors that go into it, like focal death and obviously the soil type. Um, I think that Alaskan 1964 earthquake, I think like 160 something people died. Yeah, uh, probably would have been a lot more if the population of Alaska was bigger. But there's not a lot of people that live in Alaska in comparison. So I think it just I mean, there's obviously a, some correlation. Going hey, totally. On. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's not horizontal, right? So that's how we know there's there, there, there's there's some effect of x on y, right? So we're totally right. Yes, yes. Given nothing else, if something's gonna shake at a magnitude eight, we're more likely to have more people die. But I think also what Joe's saying is it's not a tight relationship, right? It's not it's not falling off on a on a on a straight line, or or the dots aren't just a little bit varied off that straight line, right? There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise here. And so that speaks to a couple things, right? That speaks to the underlying conditions that Joe was mentioning, how many people live in the area, let's say, for one. Um, the geology of the area, right? Do we have a lot of liquefaction maybe in that, or the potential for liquefaction in that area or not? But then the other thing um, is, uh, we can choose to um, react differently, right? So check it out. So here, so and 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 and, and we have a strong uh, with many of our disasters, but particularly with earthquakes, we have a strong, we have the uh, huge potential to modify this. We, we, you, I, our society has a huge power to. Um, maybe not eliminate all deaths from earthquakes, but to really change it. So let's have a look here. So here we have um, uh, this huge earthquake in Chile, right? Almost a nine, not quite a nine, but, but you know, huge earth earthquake, right? And we're on the order of, of hundreds of folks dying, basically, right? Which is horrible. And if, and if it's your family, it, you know, end of the world, right? But overall, hundreds of folks dying. The Haiti earthquake in uh, 2010 is, uh, you know, it was only just slightly over a seven, but, you know, orders of magnitude more death. And so that speaks to um, not just the population potentially exposed, not just the underlying geology and structure, 
but also the quality of construction, right? So when we have places like Turkey, let's say, that are incredibly bad at um, enforcing codes and standards, right? Um, there's, there's a consequence for that. If you're gonna build a crappy building, those buildings are more likely to fall down, right? And uh, so, so I think one of the takeaways of this figure is there's a lot of noise, but we can we can look at and, and there's a thousand stories I'm sure we could delve into there into here if we if we had the time, but but you know theoretically things are going to be positively correlated, but it's the noise or it's a variation around that central tendency which is the most interesting thing. Why did this happen in this location? Was it because of the geological, you know, physical uh, setting in which we found ourselves? or is it because of the setting we created for ourselves? Okay, um, another aspect about uh, earthquakes when they, when they do happen and we talk about destruction is this phenomenon of, uh, well, for, firstly, what is the earthquake? The earthquake is by definition, the greatest amount of shaking, okay? The greatest amount of shaking. Now, sometimes, um, okay, so here we have, this is a date through, this is a, a time here okay so we're going from back in the day to to current and there's some earthquakes happening here this is the number how, how many earthquakes we're seeing and this is the the magnitude and what we see is there's some background stuff there's a little bit of shaking here and and then all of a sudden ba-boom right so this ba-boom would be the point where we say this is the earthquake okay anything um before this peak time is called a foreshock. Anything after this event is called an aftershock. Um, sometimes we can get potentially, depending on the fault and depending on the condition, you can get some significant uh, foreshocks. And sometimes that foreshock might trick you into thinking that is the, the main event, that is the main thing. And so we might be expecting that after the fact, we'll get some some lesser and lesser events. By definition, if subsequent earthquakes, even though they might be strong, don't reach the same amount of energy released as that, as that, uh, that large one, uh, uh, that's what's gonna define the earthquake versus a foreshock or aftershock or whatever. But the other thing I wanna mention here is, is, this, is this is a typical pattern. So um, in terms of the uh, number of earthquakes, not a lot, or the you know, small background, background number, background number, background number, relatively mostly low, low shaking, right? And then boom, we have our event. It's not an event, right? There's the major event, there's the major release of energy, but then uh, in, in pretty, and this is again, quite typical for large quakes, there's a, there's a continued you know, period of aftershocks aftershocks, aftershock, aftershock, usually of, of somewhat dec decreasing um, number and magnitude. And then boom, another, another major aftershock. And then it kind of decays a little bit and then boom, right? So over time, the trend is lower energy, lower energy. Why? Because our two, our two, our two rocks that are, our two chunks of rocks that are sliding past each other, they've released most of their energy, right? And they're they're kind of and they're kind of coming to a part where they're going to stabilize, but they're not, they're not quiet and they slip a little bit more, and that's what we're seeing measured here, right? So what does that mean? Well, it means a couple things. That means first we have the major shaking, and so you should respond, be safe, be smart. But then once the, the shaking stops, you want to take stock, get your loved ones, get folks, you get to a safe place, right? Because we know there will be these aftershocks. And your building might have withstood or your, your, wherever you are, your location where you are, might have been safe uh, during the um, initial shaking, but maybe it was, maybe the, the structure, the, the, the safety aspects were compromised in that initial shaking. And you need to, and you, it's a good idea to get out, get away, get to a safe spot. So that if another aftershock comes, the building uh, or, or area won't uh, collapse and, and cause you um, problems. Okay, so when we talk about, uh, again, sort of trying to deal with uh, earthquakes, 
<clears throat> the idea then becomes, hey, so so what, where we, where and when are we going to have these earthquakes? We can't know precisely, but can we get some information to have have at least some best guesses? And this really begins uh, for us. Really begins with the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, and so we begin the, this as we mentioned before. We talked about the the statewide report that came out of this where um, a bunch of geologists, geoscientists got together and started looking at um, what was going on and began to create our first real robust historical record of earthquakes. The big story here is the San Andreas Fault in places like where we are here in Ventura County and in Southern California, um, the consequence of looking, of geologists spending a century more than a century looking at uh, lo looking at structures and and very precisely measuring earthquakes we can actually begin to get a sense of um, uh, the historic earthquakes where they happened what their magnitude was what type of intensity even though maybe we weren't there in 18 we weren't documenting stuff say in 1857 or or whatever 1812 or whatever it is um, we can still get some estimates of what the intensity might have been from uh, written records and, and, and logs and things of that nature, but also we can get some clues by what happened with the, the um, surrounding environment. So do, or do we find a bunch of dead trees that all died in that same period of time? Um, the trees were shaken down, let's say that type of stuff. Um, and one of the, the, the clearest things again, that comes out of the 1906 earthquake is this real understanding of this San Andreas Fault. And this is the San Andreas Fault. This is um, um, south of, of the Bay Area. And this is um, a, a, an aerial view that just shows how uh, dramatic um, these two plates move. So here we have one of our, oops, where am I? Here we have one of our plates and here we have the other and, and the fissure in the middle is the fault itself. So the first thing we do is geologists after, after 1906 start mapping this stuff. And so we start creating maps that eventually become looking like this, right? Of the primary fault, of the secondary faults, of these side channels and backwaters and all that kind of stuff um, where uh, now, now these are, uh, uh, again, just for clarity, the fault isn't always right at the edge of the bound, a plate boundary, right? It, it, it can be, it is, but also these, the subsequent rocks squeezing against one another and all this and that make these, these, um, these other cracks appear and these other faults appear. So first we focus on that. Many, and so this is easy to see, right? Uh, if you know where to look, and particularly if you're say flying around or have the perspective, have a drone, have an airplane, have a balloon, something of that nature. Um, the stuff that's harder are these, again, so-called blind faults or hidden faults. And these are cracks that don't get to the surface or cracks that get to the surface, but the surface uh, where they present on the surface has been hidden because of deposition, erosion, and that kind of stuff. Um, and so this is where the greatest concern is these days, which is, are there some faults that we've not, um, we've not documented yet? And while there aren't massive ones like this, um, this comes up frequently. So there's a, there's a high rise in, in Hollywood that um, was constantly being held up for various reasons most recently, because now it appears there's maybe a new fault that we didn't really appreciate running right underneath this building. And so, um, for example, Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant has a fault running right underneath it that we didn't uh, originally understand or didn't realize when the design of that facility was beginning. So hidden faults are also a, a big part of this. Uh, what our geology friends do is they is one of the things they can do is go out and take um, cores of the earth and do, do excavation pits and things of that nature. And they can look and they can detect these different um, uh, 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 archaeological, geological uh, uh, evidence of shaking of events. And so um, by doing this in various places, we can begin to create a, ma a better map of um, the events, the timing of the event based on the, the age of the strata around it, and um, 
and sometimes even intensity of the, uh, the likely intensity of the event at those particular locations. Here is an image of uh, the aftermath of a, of a quake in Pakistan. Um, and uh, one of the biggest problems we have as we've had these cities, which started as say trading, trading uh, um, junctions, grow to be a bigger city, grow to be a large city, grow to be a city of a million people, and now you know, increasingly grow to be these mega cities of 10 or more than 10 million people around the earth, um, these sites aren't always in geologically stable areas, right? And by definition, a lot of these cities are in areas where the government struggle to meet the daily needs and, and, and governance of these areas. So this applies to all disasters, but earthquakes are perhaps the classic ones. So here we go. So here's a quote from a professor of architecture. Um, and uh, so he says, uh, this is in the wake of this um, Pakistani earthquake. Uh, Much of the building is done by people putting up their own houses, but they cannot afford proper materials and do not use skilled labor. There are many small kilns producing bricks. And you can see this is a, a mostly brick structures here. Um, in parts of Turkey where I work, a lot of, a lot of times they're dung, they're, they're, they're dried manure that's the main um, construction material, and wattle, that mixed with straw. Uh, there are many small kilns producing bricks, but because of the demand, these are not fired for the 28 days needed to make them strong. So you, in other words, you're getting folks that are doing um, construction uh, of these large urban centers, and they're not expert builders, or they don't have the time, or even if we explained it to them, maybe they wouldn't have the resources to build in the most um, uh, earthquake proof construction possible. And so that's, and then as a consequence, when we have these earthquakes, we see usually a horrible failures of many of these structures. The form of that, of that failure can take all kinds. Now, in this case, this is this small village and this is horrible. Maybe there's some folks buried in the rubble here, died in the rubble, that's horrible. As we go to larger urban centers, the um, magnitude of the infrastructure gets greater and therefore the potential, the potential consequence of its failure, failure go up. So we see things like on the left here, here's a, here's a, a wall failure. Um, and thankfully the rest of the building at least temporarily held up. Um, uh, but the next level from this would be complete collapse. And that's what you see on the right with this multi-story apartment building just failed and the whole thing um, came down. And so this is what we're really trying to avoid. In mo our modern approach, yeah. So our modern approach to dealing with uh, infrastructure um, in the, if we're in the luxury of the, um, the developed world where we have the resources theoretically and the governance theoretically to enact safe responses and, and building codes and things of that nature, the first response was to design structures that people could survive, okay? And, and again, the Japanese are the leader in this, this philosophy of dealing with earthquakes. But the first step is, uh, is make it such that you can get out of this building, right? You, you can, you, bottles might fall off the wall, pictures might fall off the walls, but, um, but you're going to be okay. Shaking stops, then you get out. Now, the approach... It, the, what we're understanding is that, man, yeah, that's great that people survive, but really we want the building to be able to survive. And so that's what um, most of our codes are designed for these days. And so in that video you guys watched last week, I was driving over this section of the Bay Bridge and just sort of talking about stuff. But right, the reason we have the new span, uh, the, the, the eastern span of the San Francisco Bay Bridge um, is so that that, that vital piece of infrastructure, that vital part of the transportation, the movement of people and goods in the San Francisco Bay Area won't um, be lost in the wake of a large earthquake. And, the, and it was, and it was de deemed here that, that this old span, which you see here collapsed and par partly collapsed in 1989, it was deemed that this was, it was too hard to make this survivable. I mean, well, it might be survivable, but it was too hard to make this um, be resilient in the next earthquake. And so as a consequence, we built an entire new chunk of the bridge and then, and then would abandon this segment 
of the bridge. So there's all kind. Oh, this slide is lame. What happened to this? Something's all wrong with my spacing. Sorry. Um, uh, so, so now we're into preparedness. Okay. So now, so now we, we we've sort of gotten the idea from history that oh, the, these earthquakes might happen in this location. They might be of this magnitude. We might even have a sense of of the the return rate, how frequency on average, how frequently on average they come back. So then the response is, how are we going to make sure that we are good? First and foremost, our buildings. So where are we locating the buildings? Are we putting the buildings in a dangerous spot or or no. Then when we do the construction, are we following, design, you know, um, there, are, will, there should be some building standards that say building like this is not allowed, building like that is. So I was just, um, I should be careful what I say, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. So I was, I, I know somebody, <laughs> I'll just say it that way, who lives in Los Angeles County and um, they, uh, have a house and they've purchased, and this is like over 25 years, 30 years, they purchased the house next to them and they rent that out. And so uh, I was having a conversation with my friend recently and uh, looking at one of the houses and the, the roof is kind of a little like goop, you know, a little uh, kind of wavy, right? How are we doing on time? We're not ready for a break, are we? Okay, not quite yet. Um, so the roof is kind of wavy type deal. I'm like, wow, that looks kind of weird. And then we, we, he's telling me about some stuff and he's like, oh yeah, this floor here is a little wavy. And so we started talking and he's telling me all this stuff. So basically this is a house that was not built to code, right? I totally get it. Building to code is a pain in the butt. You have to get the, the, the building inspector out. It costs all these fees. Sometimes it takes him a long time to come out and all those issues, right? Those are all real frustrations, real problems that need to be um, fixed. But at its heart, the reason we have these building codes is so that when we do have something like an earthquake, the building isn't going to fall down on you or, or somebody else, right? So, so building codes are one of the primary mechanisms that we um, push people to have safer structures. If we find that, say, my friend's house isn't built to code, you have to what's called retrofit. We have to go in and do something else. Now, in the case of bridges or, or hospitals or some of that nature, it might mean bolting on different structures or, or adding on different materials that'll, that'll increase the, the, the survivability, the strength, the ability to bend, the ability to absorb energy, whatever it's going to be of that structure. In some cases, it might mean you have to demolish it like the Bay Bridge and just start over because it just gets too expensive or engineering wise, it's just too impossible to make it, um, to make it uh, you know, work. Um, but then the other things that can also go on here is maybe when your house was built, I don't know if you guys know how old your houses are, maybe your house was built in the forties, maybe it was built in the fifties. And for that time, it was, it was cool, right? For that time, it was, it was not built shoddily. It was not, somebody was not trying to be irresponsible. Or wasn't weren't trying to cut corners or anything like that. They just they built how they're supposed to build. But now we know that there's a problem. For example, one of the things we learned after the 19 a very, a very ubiquitous problem in the wake of the 1994 Northridge quake, even for homes that basically survived okay, chimneys. The chimneys pulled the the brick chimneys pulled away from the houses, cracked, caused all kinds of problems. So even though most houses weren't destroyed say cr across the San Fernando Valley, weren't destroyed by the Northridge earthquake. Many, 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 many houses had to have their chimneys completely repaired, resecured, all kinds of things as a consequence. And so um, subsequently, there's been some additional building codes that have been introduced. So you cannot have a, a brick uh, fireplace the way you did, uh, the way you, they were built in the 40s and 50s, for example, in, in LA County. And so you get so-called upgrade codes. So you so so you don't have to fix your chimney, let's say, but when you go to when you go to do some activity to your house, you want to redo the plumbing, you want to you want to I don't know redo the electrical system or something. Uh, those can trigger you to oh, okay, yeah, you you need a permit to do the, the electrical. But before you get the permit for the electrical, 
you got to fix this other thing about the structure first. So that's how governments incentivize people to build to a safer standard, but not in such a way that they require everybody to spend all their money right now and do it all at once, right? That would be unreal. It's just completely unrealistic to think that that would, that would happen, even though in some kind of theoretical world, that might be nice. Uh, then another a big thing we do is uh, that was just referring to primarily private property. Uh, we can also do things like our, our large key infrastructure, the infrastructure that's, that, that moves our goods, the infrastructure that uh, uh, brings water to us, sewage treatment, that kind of stuff, um, and or infrastructure that were that uh, to fail would be catastrophic. So things like natural gas pipelines, things like uh, uh, dams above the town, that kind of stuff. So we also put a lot of work into uh, building those materials more robustly so they can take the shaking that's gonna ensue and continue to work, not just survive, but continue to work. Then we have this whole, the Great American Shakeout and, and our, these earthquake drills where you might remember these, where we have uh, you pretend like the earthquake is happening and you, you get under your desk or you get to the safe spot. Um, we go through these at school. Well, when, when we were in person at school, we'd go through these at least once a semester, which is we'd, we'd pretend there was a, a earthquake or fire or whatever it was. And we would mobilize. If you guys were in class, we would come out of class and, and, uh, and, and practice all that. So drills, rehearsing what we would do are a key part. And then uh, things like emergency planning. So not so much for you and I per se, um, but uh, I mean, absolutely for us in terms of first aid kits and you should have an all the disaster plan and know what you're gonna do. Those plans can work for wildfire, earthquakes, all types of stuff. But we usually talk about an earthquake kit uh, historically, but, but um, even more significantly for our government agencies, for EMS, for fire, police, um, so-called emergency operations centers of the town or the city or the county. And so those folks are constantly planning and getting ready. And then of course, there's the federal level where if something was just super horrible that knocked out the locals capacity, the feds could um, hopefully come in and respond and help. Uh, this is an example of uh, the building codes or the, the uniform building codes. And so uh, this really starts in the 60s. And again, with some of this long-term mapping risk and long-term potential, long potential hazards, um, we, this continues to evolve and get refined. And uh, we now have more specific codes um, that speak to the types of shaking, the magnitude of shaking we might be expected to see in these different areas. And so in the areas where we, where we most expect the greatest amount of shaking, like the San Andreas, um, uh, we have much tighter building codes than out in the middle of, you know, whatever, uh, Nevada or something. It was such that it's, so the, the um, San Andreas basically runs right through um, the Stanford campus. And uh, so one of the things that, that we found there when we were doing stuff um, and we were doing assessments of buildings, not many buildings are higher than there are, there are but, but more typically buildings are about three stories is, is the typical highest you'll see in that area. Um, not because land isn't valuable and super valuable there. And so, you know, people would like to put more houses and stuff, but it becomes exponentially more expensive to build a building higher than three stories because of the building codes, because you have to build it so strong and so robust because they're on top of the um, fault. Now, if we were to go up to Portland or something like that, you could build a, a five-story building for much, much more, much more cheaply. And not just because it's outside of California, but because of those different building codes. Um, yeah, right. Um, okay. Uh, and then there's, there's adjustments that'll happen in the wake of a major disaster. So uh, we talked about Lisbon, right? The, the Portugal example in, in our previous lecture. Uh, we've mentioned the San Francisco earthquake, uh, the Kobe, Japan earthquake. All of these uh, responses, modern cities, when we have the earthquake, the answer is not, generally speaking, let's abandon this area. The answer is, hey, let's 
let's build back stronger. Let's, um, we might have to demolish this building, but we're gonna put a, a more robust structure in its place. In contrast, um, back in the day, uh, sometimes we just abandon areas, right? And um, nowadays we only, with most disasters, we typically only quote unquote abandon an area um, if we're talking about something like a, a highly toxic situation. So a chemical release or a radiological release and contamination, then we talk about abandonment. So for example, the area um, around Chernobyl, for example, the area in the immediate zone uh, in uh, Fukushima pro pro prefecture um, around the uh, Daiichi power plant that melted down in the wake of the earthquake and tsunami in Japan. Uh, but an interesting example is this uh, town in Guatemala and they, uh, there's a nearby volcano and again, did not understand the science of earthquakes back then. But back then, uh, uh, the church was the Catholic Church. Was, this is when Spain was in charge. The colonial power was ruling this area with a with an iron fist, and um, the Catholic Church was in charge. <clears throat> and there was a series of earthquakes, and so their worldview, their model, said that um, they, they didn't understand plate tectonics or anything like that. So they they took it to mean um, this was uh, a vengeful God. This was the wrath of God. This was a consequence of of immoral behavior or whatever, and they had a series of earthquakes uh, throughout the 1700s. And so ultimately, it led the Catholic Church to say, we have to abandon this city. So they, they left the city, they moved the city to a new location and, and partly scavenged the old city to get materials to build the new city. But that, that notion of complete abandonment is something that we, in modern times, we don't we don't do that in the wake of hurricane and the wake of most disasters. We just rebuild. It is interesting. We talk about things like sea level rise and other, other um, disasters, particularly climatological disasters. Maybe that's something we should, we should think about. Not every, every case and every situation, but in some cases it may be that it's just too, um, too dangerous or, or too risky to continue to live in that area. But for the most part, most of our response is the lower half of this figure. Mostly we've chosen to, and we choose to rebuild. And um, uh, again, hopefully we're rebuilding more robustly. Um, recent administrations decided that wasn't important, but we've gone back to the policy now of saying we do have a disaster that um, the rebuilding should make the community more resilient to future disasters. That's now uh, executive order of the federal government. Um, I forget what I was gonna say about this, but this is again the Bay Bridge. Um, okay, so maybe we'll take a quick pause here since we're almost at our time and um, uh, we'll take a quick 10 minute break and we'll return and keep talking about earthquake risk and prediction. Cool. Unless the other has questions. Questions so far before we, before we pause? Okay, see everybody in 10 minutes. Yes. Okay, so uh, just to wrap up here with our uh, earthquake science talking, um, uh, we'd like to move, while it's probably gonna be impossible to perfectly predict earthquakes, right? We wanna move more towards uh, uh, doing that as much as we can, or get, uh, at least get, get closer and closer. So the long-term methods, as we, as we talked about, are these geological approaches. So modeling, 
doing excavation pits, looking at structures, tracking historical earthquakes, um, uh, detecting new faults, etc. And so what we get um, from that is stuff like this. We get long-term probabilities, right? And th this is what we're, we're primarily using in those building codes and other things, which is uh, uh, how likely are we going to have, or how likely is it we're going to have an earthquake uh, happening in the next time period? This one is used as 30 years. Again, why do you guys, do you guys remember why we, why 30 years is sort of a popular thing to use in terms of risk or hazard discussions and disaster planning? Is it because of the home mortgage? Right, right. Because most people, uh, the, the, mo the most common are sort of half that and then that uh, in terms of uh, paying for your house. So most people go towards the 30 year mortgage. And so that, I mean, you can have obviously refinance and do things, but, but th that's why we have that, that window there or that, that time window. So it, it's relevant to homeowners. Homes for most of us are the most expensive things we own or will ever own um, in our lives. Most of us don't own um, skyscrapers and, and I don't know, gazillion dollar, gazillion dollar, dollar lots and things of that nature. Um, uh, I just got some note that says that I should tell my students to update Zoom today or something. But apparently some good features or something. So um, after classes today, <laughs> you should update your Zoom. Um, okay, so, so, so we, have, we have this, right? So we have this long-term estimate. And then we'll, and, and so, so this, this is pretty good. And we're, we're, we're constantly getting better at this, constantly working on this. But this is, this only does so much, right? So this tells us, you know, hey, is it going to happen in the next, is there, is there a good chance in the next decade or two, right? Which is great to know, very useful information. But we'd really like to know if it's earth, Earthway is going to come tomorrow or not, right? Or, or an hour from now or, or 30 seconds from now kind of thing. And so <clears throat> the short-term predictions have mostly focused on uh, a precursor phenomenon. Precursor phenomenon would be um, months to weeks to days type of thing. We've mentioned four shocks, right? So again, you don't know if it's a four shock or it's an earthquake until after the fact. Um, it's like, how do you know if you're in recession or not? You got to kind of have to look at the historic data. Um, uh, but um, four shocks, uh, if, if we are building towards a, a bigger earthquake, if we had an earthquake and then, you know, a couple weeks later, a bigger earthquake and a couple weeks later, an even bigger earthquake, that depending on the fault and stuff, that could suggest that um, we're building towards something big. That could also mean we're releasing pressure. So, so hard to know. Um, sometimes you do see ground deformation as that pressure is really, um, you know, building and building and building. Similarly, uh, kind of like the volcanoes, uh, the volcano discussion, you sometimes can see fluctuation in water levels. <clears throat> uh and aquifers and things of that nature um wells and stuff uh some people have argued you can see changes in local ra radio wave characteristics some people claim that you can see differences in animal behavior uh this hasn't really been borne out but it is it, it was the first major evacuation of a city was in 1975 in china uh, and uh, because the animals started acting all squirrely and they, they got people out of the city and there was an earthquake. So, so something about animals can perceive subtle, more, maybe more subtle shaking or something of that nature might be helpful. Um, uh, all of the, the more we can predict though, the more we can use whatever tools to figure out if something is coming, um, the more we can work on moving people around. Primarily, that's what we're mostly worried about, shutting down sensitive infrastructure, things like moving trains, um, perhaps uh, uh, you know, shutting off the valves of some gas pipelines, things of that nature, and, and rescheduling major events that might concentrate people in a vulnerable space. Um, so that takes us to where we are now. That takes us to where we are now in California. And so... Um, these uh, will start with the stuff that, um, again, is looking towards uh, understanding what has happened. And so these are the so-called did you feel it maps. You can get an app. You can on your phone. If you guys, if you guys are so interested, you can um, uh, have it on or not even have it on. But just if you feel an earthquake, you can activate that app and you can say, 
uh, in a very easy to understand. Uh, did I feel it? Did I not feel it? Did did stuff fall off the walls? Did stuff not fall off the walls? Very uh, just a, a couple of quick questions. Or you can go to the USGS website, and we'll just take a look at that. Oops, didn't go there for some reason. We can just. I don't know where it went. Uh, I guess we have to go over here. Did you feel it? Okay, so um, this for every earthquake that we have, uh, this is a, a chance to essentially use citizen science and crowdsource the data collection. Um, not as helpful with the magnitude, but really helpful with regards to the intensity, right? And to confirm things. If it's in a new place, we don't have a lot of data. Wow, that, that gets us going. But even if we do think we understand, this confirms our models. Are we really understanding it? Or, oh my gosh, do we have a lot greater um, uh, perception of shaking in this location versus another? So we'll just take a look at one of these. Let's see one that has a lot of responses. This is... Um, uh, San Antonio, Chile. Okay, so if we look at this particular one, so this is uh, the shaking. Uh, yeah, this wasn't as, maybe that wasn't as good a one to pick. Um, yeah, so data not available. Okay, maybe we should maybe I should have picked a different one. Let's pick a different one. Latest earthquake. Let's pick the latest earthquake. Let's go to. Um, Let's go to this one here. One in geysers, California. Okay, so all of these circ so all of these uh, circles here, these are going to be where keep keep clicking. Uh, so these are where we're having activity, right? And then this guy in question is the center point here. I guess I zoomed in too much. Um, and so what we're looking at here is where the earthquake was and the magnitude of it. And felt report. Okay, so um, did we feel it? Uh, no, so yes, or we, we did or we didn't. If we did, we'd say that. And then we'd say, um, uh, where were you? So what was the, the area around you? Um, were you asleep? Did it wake you up? Basically, um, do those feel it, whatever. Da, 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 da. And you can do this after the fact. So you could maybe experience this at one o'clock this afternoon, and maybe you weren't by your computer, or maybe your internet got knocked out or what have you. You can file this post hoc. Um, but we go through, and then we're going to give us give. So I did not feel this one. And I'm going to give my address as one University Drive, Camarillo, California. And then we'll say, okay, and then I'll go down here. And uh, for all these, I guess I should answer these questions. So no, I did not feel it. Um, what was your situation? I was inside a building at the time that one happened. Was I, where I, was I asleep? Slept through it. Did others nearby feel it? Uh, no, nobody in my house felt that earthquake. Um, how would you describe the shaking? Uh, not felt. Uh, how did you react? Uh, no reaction, not felt. How did you respond? Took no action. Uh, was it difficult to stand? Uh, no. Uh, did you notice any swinging doors? No. Did you hear any creaking or other noises? No. Did objects rattle or topple or no? Did pictures on the walls get knocked off? No. Uh, did any furniture or appliances become displaced? No. Was a heavy appliance affected? No. Were freestanding walls or fences damaged? No. Was there any damage to the building? No. Um, and, and notice for each of these, there, there's finer scale divisions, right? Hairline cracks, a few cracks, many cracks, windows cracked, um, on and on and on. And you can you can provide your your information if you if you want to go ahead and do that. So then, boom, we submitted this. So now now when a lot of people have this, we can begin to to get a sense of um, uh, how, what the intensity was like in the wake of that earthquake. And then when we look at a lot of earthquakes in an area, we can get a sense of the likelihood that, that this area could have um, some significant destruction in the wake of a 
five, six, seven magnitude quake. Next thing I want, wait, let's see what I want to say, say next. Um, yeah, okay. So the next I wanted to show you guys this, which is just the USGS portal. And this is our late, these are our latest earthquakes. So um, uh, this is, at, let me refresh this. Maybe, maybe an earthquake just happened. Let's check. Okay. So uh, let me close that. So, so here we are. Th this, is, this is our area. We can uh, go to just California. And so we've had, uh, today was pretty boring. The other day was more interesting, but, but we've, it's, it's pretty boring here. Um, so in the last uh, day, last 24 hours, we've had 37 quakes the USGS has monitored. To be clear, the USGS monitors primarily the US, but also the world. So they have sensors around the world. And also because of the way S waves and, and P waves propagate, we can, even though we might not have sensors in other parts of the world, because we have a robust network, we can estimate where these, where these earthquakes happened and their magnitude, et cetera, in places beyond the US borders. Um, but anyway, but so if, if we want to know about this earthquake, we would just click it as we did before. Um, we can find out about uh, uh, the do you feel a map, what's going on. We can get all the information. And this one doesn't look very exciting, but um, we can also download um, things to our mobile mapping devices. And so um, really helpful here to have all this displayed for us. Now, the last little bit that I want to mention is... Uh, is uh, this whole idea of, can we predict earthquakes, right? Which is what we're talking about. So, so, so far we talked about the USGS mapping the stuff that already happened. Well, the, now we know how fast earthquakes move, right? And they move through rocks, different densities of rocks, different strata of rocks, they'll change the speed, et cetera. Depending on where this is gonna happen, this can take some time to get to us. So the current uh, uh, state of the art is this technology that's now rolled out in California. You can get the app on your phone. We'll watch a, a, a short video in a second. Um, but basically, if we have an earthquake, boom, it starts here. The, the waves start propagating. The surface waves start propagating. The, the subsurface waves start propagating. But it's not instantaneous, right? It, it's fast, um, but it's not, it's not speed of light fast. If we have sensors in the ground that detect this mo motion and uh, are hooked up to a computer network that's automatically doing the, the initial estimate of location, magnitude, et cetera, and the direction of the propagation of the waves, we could signal a center, that se the computer center, that center could then broadcast out notices. Broadcast out notices to your cell phone so you can get your cell phone can start chirping and say, say, you know, danger, danger, uh, uh, brace for an earthquake. Might not be much time. We're talking on the order of a few seconds to maybe tens of seconds. But that could be enough, for example, to, to, to depower or to, to activate the braking system for Bay Area rapid transit, for light rail. Um, to, to do sh emergency shutoffs on gas pipelines, things of that nature, just enough to avoid some of the worst of the worst. And if it's in my house, oh man, at least, at least I have a couple seconds to get to a safer spot than, than in front of the plate glass window where I'm standing or something of that nature. Um, so that's the idea. Uh, this is hooked into transportation networks, Caltrans, things of that nature, but you can also get it on your phone. And assuming that your phone is in cell phone range of a, of a cell tower, you could be getting that, that notice and give you a few precious seconds, maybe enough to grab your, your baby, maybe enough to step outside, something of that nature. So let's watch a little quick video. It's only about two minutes long that just sort of talks about this. Make sure I have my volume up. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Boyd. When it comes to earthquake preparedness, California has all California has always been on the front lines. And on Thursday, a special advisory board took a very big step in developing an earthquake early warning system for the state's 39 million residents. It is definitely a bold challenge. And experts say they're closer than ever. 
Welcome to the uh, Earthquake Early Warning Advisory Board. The initial meeting of the California Earthquake Early Warning Advisory Board kicked off Thursday at the state capitol. Today was terrific just to educate uh, everyone. There's a lot to learn for these members who come from utilities, emergency services, business, academia, health, natural resources, and government. All of them are, are on this uh, advisory council, which is going to help to shape uh, the whole earthquake early morning system and the best way to roll it out the most efficient way and how to accelerate that process. Earthquake, earthquake, moderate shaking. The long road to an early warning system starts with understanding earthquakes and the technological and human challenges of an effective, reliable system. SB 135, which established Cal OES as the lead organization. Presentations by Cal OES' Tina Curry and Ryan Arba, and by Doug Given of the U.S. Geological Survey. Our goal is to do a three-state system uh, to protect the entire West Coast. Shedded much needed light on what the board faces in the coming months and years. Clearly, California is the leader. California is leading the U.S. with this effort, which includes beta testing sensors and alert systems already installed. We still have a ways to go, but this governance structure will help to take all of the great efforts that have been going on and make sure that they are moving in the most appropriate and efficient manner. This is a test. Of course, one of the bigger hurdles, if not the biggest, is mobile phone technology. Given says we are three to seven years away from cell technology that can handle the alerts and this being necessary to be effective. If you'd like more information on this story as well as any of the others, all you have to do is go to OESnews. Okay. So, uh, so that was uh, three years ago. And so it, it's on your phone now if you guys are so interested in getting, getting it. Um, so he's right. The issue is it's it's faster for the transportation networks, BART, light rail, utilities, uh, that kind of stuff. Those guys get it. Those guys are sort of hardline fiber optics. It takes a little bit longer for us, by a little bit longer on the order of five, six, nine, ten seconds longer for that system to propagate through the cell phone networks, depending on where we are in the state. And again, we're only talking a few seconds to ten seconds or so, typically. Um, it, it obviously depends on the earthquake, right? If the earthquake's way far away, we have more time. But if the earthquake is right next to us, there's essentially no time. Um, so uh, it's not, not a guarantee. This is not a panacea. We're not going to be able to predict every earthquake. But definitely, um, under certain conditions, we can possibly get some early warning. Um, and so I would encourage you all to consider uh, uh, getting the early warning app on your phone. And uh, as it, again, it doesn't work all over in the state. And so if you're up in the Sierras or whatever, it, it doesn't really, uh, I, I don't believe it'll work right now, but, but in some of these high concentration areas we're most worried about danger, the San Francisco Bay area, greater Los Angeles area where we are, um, you guys can get it and at least it's, it's something. Um, so that is uh, where we are now in terms of prediction. And, and, and in fact, that's not really prediction, right? That's really more just, uh, very fast warning that it's happening, right? Um, the last thing I'll end here, since we're almost out of time, is um, is the notion of creating earthquakes. So I mentioned before that we can uh, create seismic disturbances, and indeed that is done for geological exploration purposes, petroleum exploration purposes, et cetera, to look at the stratigraphy and the underlying uh, structure of rocks. Um, and we've been doing that for some time. Uh, but we've also now come to realize, and this was controversial for a little bit, but, but it's now pretty much clear. So we, California, just numerically, in the terms of the number of earthquakes, California used to lead the U.S. in terms of the number of earthquakes, um, obviously because of all the stuff we've been talking about on the edge of the Pacific Plate, et cetera. Uh, currently, though, the, the state of Oklahoma has numerically more earthquakes, not, not major quakes, but numerically more earthquakes than we do. Why? Because of their uh, oil and gas fracking. Um, so in the case of, of uh, uh, hydraulic fracture, what we're doing is we're, um, we're, we're, we're breaking up the um, uh, structure, the geological structure, and making gas more, more easily um, uh, permeable through 
um, cap rock, through rock that normally is impenetrable, through rock that exists there and has created essentially a bubble of petroleum underneath it. So we, 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 we break that in the fracking process and then we interject some materials to keep those cracks open. Little, you can imagine little grains of sand keeping the cracks open. And then we're able to, to get access to all of those hydrocarbons. In the process of doing that, we use a lot of water. We, we get a lot of so-called produced water. Produced water is when we do oil and gas. We, we suck oil and gas out of the ground. We get oil and gas, we get hydrogen sulfide, and we also get, you can think of it as dirty water, sort of tainted water, so oily water. Um, that's called produced water. It's water produced from the well. So we don't use that in, in most uh, refining processes or anything. So you have to do something with it. In the case of, and in the case of this stuff, it's, it's not clean water, right? You'd have to go through a lot of treatment to make it clean. So what most folks do then is take that, that used injection well water and, and produced water and re-put it back down in the ground, okay? So, so hopefully below the aquifer level, so you're not contaminating the aquifer, but nevertheless, you're injecting a lot of water underground. And so just like we talked about our, our um, at the start of discussing this, we have these, these two rocks that are pushing against each other. There's a lot of friction, right? A lot of resistance to movement. Essentially, what we're doing is we're squirting a lot of water in essentially we're lubricating well well we're changing the pressure fields one so we're changing the amount of squeezing on these rocks by 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 changing the amount of stuff jammed underneath there under pressure but then two in theory you maybe you're, you're lubricating there's all kinds of different ramifications the point is we're changing the subsurface pressure fields so as a consequence we're seeing tons of earthquakes so we can actually um by doing um this is nothing that would be cost effective on its own, but we are giving ourselves more earthquakes as a direct consequence of our oil and gas activity. To be clear, this is not happening in California, or at least not routinely happening in California. This is, uh, this is a phenomenon that, that's more tied to the geology of uh, that part of the country. Um, but nevertheless, it is true that we're no longer the earthquake capital. So Oklahoma, by doing intense oil and gas excavation, has given themselves tons of earthquakes. So, um, so in that sense, we, we, are, we, we do, are doing a good job of predicting where earthquakes will be in Oklahoma. So, so hey, we're, we're, we're making more earthquakes. Um, so there you go. So in some cases, the best way to predict something is to make it happen. And then you know that then your prediction is, is dead on. So, okay. So there we go. So we covered... Uh, the basics of earthquake science today. We talked about the types of um, uh, uh, where earthquakes come, where earthquakes come from. We talked about faults. We talked about some of the the underlying uh, uh, terminology and and structure. We talked about how seismic waves propagate around. We how we use seismometers to uh, measure uh, what was going on. We've talked about magnitude and intensity. Magnitude, the amount of energy released. Intensity, the destructive consequence of that earthquake on the surface of the earth. And we've talked a bit about how we, um, how we have responded to these um, threats, that this, this uh, threat that's very scary and can just seem to spring upon us with no warning uh, in terms of building codes, in terms of different approaches to uh, uh, planning, et cetera. And then we just uh, wrapped up with talking a little bit about um, current data, uh, uh, getting a better feel for um, uh, recent earthquakes in terms of citizen science and in terms of really great instrumentation uh, run by the USGS, the United States Geological Survey. And then uh, uh, lastly, the, the, current, uh, the current front, which is trying to, if not predict, at least give us um, a few seconds of heads up before we experience the primary brunt of the earthquake. Um, yeah, so the last thing I'll say as we, as we log off is I hope everybody uh, has an earthquake kit. It can double as your wildfire kit, your disaster kit in general. Uh, I would encourage you all to make sure you have one, make sure your families have one. And not only that, make sure you have something, um, since we are mostly a mobile society, don't just have it at your house. Don't just have it um, with your parents' house or whatever. Have stuff in your car. Most of the things are going to have, most of us spend most of, not during Zoom 
time, but, but, but uh, when we get back to the regular times, right, most of us are not spending most of our days in our homes. We're mostly out and about. And so, so some real significant disaster planning will really help you, not just with the wildfire situation, um, but for any of, these, any of these situations. And a good responsive uh, plan and a good uh, disaster response kit will be really helpful. Those kits will always tell, or, or the preparation folks to always say, hey, have enough for, for uh, you know, three days or so. Increasingly, when we look at the, 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 the disasters like these earthquakes, you probably want the ability to be on your own for more than just three days. So the ability to have enough water, food, shelter, warmth for uh, communications for um, probably closer to five to seven days. Hopefully you won't need that, but if you do have that, you have that confidence. And not just for you, but for you and anybody in your, your, your household. So you, your friends, you, your roommates, you, your family members, you, your pets, uh, you know, enough pet food and, and whatever your, your pet may need. If you need medications, all that kind of stuff. This is a perfect time to plan for this. We've all been stuck at home. We've all been sequestered. Uh, and we've sort of been eating through our pantries and doing everything. So it's a perfect time now as, as people are getting vaccinated, people are starting to head out in the world um, and things are, are, are ceasing to become as rare as they were. Great time to go through and make yourself a, a, a kit um, or, or, or make a list of what you need for your kit and go ahead and get that stuff. Fantastic idea for birthday presents, fantastic idea for Christmas presents, et cetera. Many of the, the things that will work for one of our disasters will work for another disaster. Um, and uh, take it from me, uh, uh, the, uh, two, two Christmases ago, I gave a bunch of my family um, a half mask respirators with, with, with canisters, which is sort of a nerdy present to give. Um, but I gave, I thought, oh man, this is gonna freak people out, giving people uh, disaster kits for, for a holiday present. And everybody loved them. Everybody totally loved it. They work. Those breathing things work obviously for wildfires, but they also work in the wake of an earthquake, right? So if you do have some damage to your home and there's a lot of dust in the air, those most of the elements of our response kits will work for earthquakes and anything. Um, so I really encourage you guys, if you don't have a kit, if you don't have a plan to think about that, and, uh, and hopefully at the end of this class, you guys have been thinking about this, but by the end of this class, but, but earthquakes are the, are the classic thing that spurred people to start acquiring water in their homes, uh, food in their homes, et cetera, even though we may be more typically think about wildfire uh, planning and things of that nature for us. Okay, um, and with that, I guess we're getting close to being out of time. So I will pause and uh, say thanks, you guys. We've not gotten to tsunamis. So the next thing we're going to cover uh, are tsunamis. Now tsunamis, we typically think of as being caused by earthquakes. And indeed, about 80% of tsunamis are caused by um, an earthquake. And so that's the most common thing. However, we can get tsunamis generated from non-earthquake mechanisms. Um, so, so we'll talk about this as sort of the last part of our earthquakes, but it's really sort of a, 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 a kind of um, an overlapping, but, but somewhat distinct category from earthquakes. So that's our next disaster. I will talk to you guys soon. Um, I did not, you guys will notice that I did not require uh, uh, to do our next um, um, case study that I originally was planning on last week. There was some issues with a couple of students that I had to, to work out. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so with that, I'm gonna kill the recording. And then if you guys have questions, we can talk. Let me just stop sharing, stop the recording, stop the recording.